Hello to all of you and welcome to this edition of Tech24. The first quantum revolution gave way to lasers and transistors, while the second ushered in MRIs and GPS. But the technology has many more promises for the future. We tell you why quantum computing is becoming such a strategic sector. And in Test24, we'll take a look at Valonis's newborn star Vespera, a perfect hybrid between a smart telescope and a camera that picked up the Best Innovation Award at this year's CES trade show. Now, quantum physics constitutes a huge change in how one understands the world and conceives reality. This is indeed a shift from the simple, intuitive, and straightforward classical paradigm to the quantum world that describes much more convoluted, counterintuitive, and simply amazing phenomena. Digging into the quantum dimension is a wake-up call about how little we actually know about our world. We're going to attempt today to explain to you what quantum, quantum physics is uh, with our tech editor, Peter O'Brien, thank you. The task is huge today, quite, uh, quite daunting, I, I assume. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what exactly is quantum physics. I think the problem, Julia, is that we still, many of us still t seem to think in a classical physics mindset. So the kind of physics we were taught in school about force, mass, acceleration, the kind of developed by Galileo and Newton, our friends here. But we need to start thinking more about the subatomic level because what happens there doesn't actually look like the physical world as we know it in a classical sense whatsoever. And the first thing you've got to realize is that on a microscopic level, particles can both act like a particle and like a wave at the same time. So our world looks a little bit more like what happens in the movie Inception, right? Even though it's, it's kind of complicated to understand that movie uh, as well. But could you try to explain how things actually work on that actually atomic level? To be honest, I find that film even more hard to understand than all of this. I'm probably going to find it easier explaining this stuff. So I'll take you through three fundamental examples of quantum physics. Quantum entanglement is the idea that no matter f how far apart two particles can be from each other, they can still share similar behaviors and seem to influence each other. No matter if they're light years apart, they can do this in an instant. Second big idea is quantum superposition, which is this idea that a particle can be in multiple states and positions at once. And then we've also got quantum tunneling, which is on a nanoscopic level, if you've got a barrier that normally an electron might not be able to get through because it doesn't have enough energy, it can simply just teleport through it anyway. So most of us still have a lot of problems understanding all of this, but actually scientists have been working on quantum physics for over 20 years. This is all called part of the first quantum revolution, a quite a grandiose name, I know, or quantum 1.0. And that's the idea that um, all of these, this new understanding that we've got about quantum physics has led us to innovate and invent things like GPS, lasers, LEDs, MRI scanners, uh, solar panels. Um, but I think for me, the biggest invention of all has to be the semiconductor. Because we know about the quantum world now and we understand more about how electrons work, we can alter the, we can alter the energy levels inside semiconductor materials like silicon. And this has led us to invent the transistor of which there are billions of little switches in all of the computers in the world. So that's for the past and the present of quantum computing. Let's now talk about the future. Uh, the quantum computers actually promise to do computing tasks much faster than any traditional computers. And this is paving the way for incredible innovations in all sectors like medtech, communications, or IoT. So much so that private corporations and states are now engaged in an arms race to reach so-called quantum supremacy. Well, for more on this, let's turn to Eleni Diamanti, senior researcher at the CNRS here in Paris. Hello and welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you. So you're actually a specialist of quantum communication. Could you describe for our viewers what this new world uh, is going to look like with this new technology? Absolutely. So one important aspect of quantum communication is that once we will have our quantum computers and other devices like quantum sensors, for example, we would like these devices and systems to be connected. Um, and for this, we need quantum communication networks. One particular aspect by which quantum communication infrastructure can help us is by enhancing the capability of such devices by distributing, for example, the computation. So this is giving rise to applications that we could not possibly imagine with classical infrastructure. 
The second aspect is more linked to security. And so quantum communication and cryptography gives us access to a security level for our communications that again is not possible with classical cryptographic techniques. And so, and so such networks will allow us to, to solve uh, cryptographic problems that were otherwise inaccessible. So we often hear that quantum calculations could actually put an end altogether to cryptocurrencies um, or even blockchain. Why is that? Um, so we need to be careful when we talk about that. So I should say that cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and blockchain, they are based you typically on a combination of cryptographic algorithms on all sorts of different techniques. So some of them are vulnerable against the advent of a quantum computer. Um, and therefore, they may open some uh, vulnerabilities, some insecure aspects of these cryptocurrencies. And therefore, they will have to be somehow adapted uh, to, to, to the advent of quantum computers and quantum technology. So I would say, um, I wouldn't say that cryptocurrencies are in danger right now or should be replaced but right now, but they will be adapted and enhanced and, and, and changed in, respect, in, in, in this respect to, um, to, 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 to adapt, yes, to these quantum computing technologies that are coming onwards. Now, many experts believe that quantum computing could actually be the answer to this pandemic, for instance, by accelerating vaccine development. Is this actually realistic? Hmm. So, um, it, again, it's very dangerous to affirm that uh, things like this. The, ve the, the first aspect of my answer would be that the very first thing that we need to wait for is a quantum computer that can actually perform uh, optimization, solve optimization problems um, sufficiently well. So we would have to, uh, we have seen examples of how um, preliminary, let's say, quantum computers and devices can reach this quantum supremacy, like we call them levels. But this is not enough uh, to be able to solve problems like the ones that would be expected uh, for, uh, for vaccines. But what could happen is once we have these bigger, larger scale quantum computers, one of the biggest application of them would be in chemistry and so and so indeed we would be expected to be able to simulate physical processes that are very complex and once you can do that then you can solve optimization problems including designing new medicine so this would open the way uh, to, to to finding solutions to such uh, to such problems so I think I would say this is a long-term perspective but there is hope Eleni Diamanti thank you very much indeed for that and we're now going to open a space chapter in the show, starting with Virgin Orbit that has finally reached space eight months after the first demonstration flight of its air-launched rocket system failed. Virgin is just one of a handful of companies that have privatized the space race, as Emerald Maxwell explains. Released mid-air from the underside of a modified Boeing 747, some 35,000 feet over the Pacific, the Launcher 1 rocket then succeeded in doing what a previous attempt last May failed to do, soaring into space. It's a first for Virgin Orbit, the rocket company founded by British billionaire Richard Branson. I think every single goal that uh, Virgin Orbit um, uh, set uh, were met. Um, it was on schedule, it was safe, um, it was the first ever air-launched uh, liquid-fueled rocket um, ever, ever to go into space. Uh, we were carrying a, a full load of satellites from NASA. They, they are absolutely elated. Sunday's success is a big boost for Virgin, which is turning up the heat on big-name commercial rivals like Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. In particular, Virgin Orbit is racing against other rocket startups like Firefly Aerospace to fill growing demand in the small satellite launching business. Currently, it's the only company to offer an air launch method, which minimizes weather-related cancellations like the one SpaceX encountered with its first launch this year. Executives also say it's cheaper than the traditional vertical rocket launch and allows satellites to be placed in their intended orbit more efficiently. It went to the exact uh, orbit, every satellite went to the exact orbits that they were meant to go to. The wonderful thing was, although it took three or four hours of, of uh, nerve-wracking nerve moments, um, they, they, uh, they are all reporting back to Earth. With this commercial demonstration in the books, Branson's company will officially transition into commercial service for its next mission. Virgin Orbit is separate from Virgin Galactic, 
also founded by Branson, but which aims to carry passengers on suborbital expeditions so that they can experience the sights and sensations of spaceflight. Those trips are expected to begin later this year. And we're going to stay in space in Test 24. If you ever wanted to gaze up at the planets and galaxies but don't know how to find them, French company Vaonis has the solution. It's not the first time that we showcase them here on the show, but this is their latest device, and it's called Vespera. It is indeed. I really like it. It's such a sleek, lightweight, compact telescope. You can even fit it in a backpack. And it's also very smart because you just connect it to your smartphone or other device. And because it knows your GPS coordinates from that, it knows exactly where to find what you're looking for in the night sky. So you'll connect it and if you, you'll say, you know, I want to look for the Andromeda galaxy. If that's up there, then it will rotate and it will swivel and will, it will find it for you and relay the video feed back onto your phone where you can take pictures or stargaze to your heart's content. Now at 1,500 euros, it is on the more expensive side for telescopes. And I do think it's a bit of a shame it doesn't have a viewfinder. You have to have the video feed through your, your device. But I just think it's, it's, it's such, such a smart little gadget. Um, and for those of us who want to look down at the Earth rather than up again, well, Canon's released a new website where you can explore the, the pictures taken by their new microsatellite, which is whizzing around taking pictures of Earth in high definition. Well, thank you very much for that. We're actually going to leave you with these pictures found on Canon's website, where you can explore the world as captured by their new microsatellite. See you soon.